Garvin, uh, maybe uh, I could start with you. Uh, you work in the city, and um, maybe you, you give us an idea of what the prevailing mood is in the city at the moment, and I suppose a little bit more specifically what their main concerns are at this stage, one, almost one year on from Brexit. Okay, um, clearly uh, what everybody has got over is the initial surprise within the, within the city, and there is now an acceptance of it is going to happen. Um, Prevailing mood is around you know, what are they going to do to insulate uh, the impact uh, upon their businesses to the great extent possible. Um, as we're all aware, uh, everybody has been given the uh, deadline of the 14th of July to inform the PRA around their Brexit strategy. Um, so um, clearly organisations are at an advanced stage in, term of, in terms of determining how they're going to uh, facilitate continuing to the greatest extent possible on a BAU basis. I mean, clearly it's going to be, there will have to be incremental infrastructure that, it, that they'll be de deploy, there will be new modus operandi, new operational constructs that will have to happen, but um, uh, it is around, you know, how do we get through this as opposed to can we resist it or can we remain in denial? Um, I think from our organisation, um, you know, clearly as the, as, the, as the largest asset manager in Europe um, and you know, a, a very substantial provider of life assurance outside the UK as well as in, in the UK, um, when we look at it from an economic perspective, we actually see ourselves being well positioned. Um, and uh, it is about making sure that the, the customer impact is minimised, and then obviously from a business perspective, there's a minimal impact. And from that customer perspective, I mean, the, 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 is there, I suppose, an acceptance that the, that the passport may be gone? Oh, and there's an absolute acceptance that the passport is gone. So the question is, is what is it that, that will, will be available? You know, is, is the route, and again, um, debates are around, do, do you go for a, a third country type of branch structure, or do you go for a formal, brand new corporate entity in a jurisdiction then that, that ultimately facilitates the entry to uh, the remaining European members? Um, clearly, one of the big challenges is, and again, in a Solvency II world, we all know about the incremental governance uh, that, that sits around a, an entity. Uh, which is quite substantial um, and uh, definitely not something that we uh, underestimate and actually in fact as an organisation we've gone through quite a significant thinning process um, to diminish the number of corporate entities, uh, regulated corporate entities that we have around uh, uh, the globe and within Europe. Um, so creating another one is not something we take on lightly. Uh, so when we make a decision um, and I mean, effectively, we have made a decision as to location. Um, that is the location, and that is from where we will launch uh, all European activities. And, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to ask you about your location, uh, but the, maybe if I maybe move on a little bit to, uh, to, to Kieran for a second. Um, maybe this time around December of last year, I mean, I suppose the view would have been that Ireland was particularly well placed. Uh, as a location uh, where um, insurance companies would look at establishing. Um, we're now maybe six months on and there have been maybe a number of high profile cases which haven't chosen Ireland. Um, what is your assessment um, of the Irish offering for such companies at this point in time? And well, firstly, we've had more than 80 inquiries from a range of financial services groups since last June. And that number has leveled off now, but there's still a trickle of incremental inquiries. We've had a considerable number of site visits to Ireland by technical teams and by senior management up to chair, group chairman level as part of the due diligence, the locational evaluation. Several firms, including insurance firms, have advised us that having completed their due diligence, they've selected Ireland um, as their response to Brexit. 
Um, a number of them have yet to formally announce their intentions because they're going through a conversation with the central bank and with the PRA or the Bank of England, um, etc. But there will be announcements forthcoming. Certainly, I would expect from June forward, in part because of the letter issued by the Bank of England looking for confirmation of the uh, Brexit contingency plans before July 14th. I would say overall, all of the groups have said to us that they view the Irish proposition as very compelling um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and I can go into them later on if you wish, Lee. Yeah, I mean, do you, maybe, do you want to maybe, I mean, where do you see Ireland as meeting the most important needs of these companies, say, better than our competitors? Yeah, I think what's really interesting, and refer, Garen referred to it as, as business as usual, the consensus view of the groups that we're talking to is that Brexit is all cost, and that there's no guarantee of a compensating revenue uplift for incurring all of the cost and going to the trouble of relocating your EU-facing business or doing what we call an EU carve-out. So they clearly want to execute a, a relocation in the most cost-effective way um, as possible. So that really matters to them. I think they all recognize that London is not going to disappear as a global financial center and therefore in a curious way one of our great strengths is our proximity to London. Now you need to define proximity in a variety of ways. Geographic proximity obviously, cultural proximity, English speaking etc. But also organizational proximity. So business leaders here where groups have an existing presence in Ireland are very close with their peers and colleagues uh, in, in London. And a lot of groups feel culturally closer to Ireland, therefore given a choice between moving west and move, moving east, there's a preference to go across the Irish Sea and that they believe will help retain functional and personal and market relationships back in, uh, in, in London, in the UK. Um, so that really matters to them. The fact that we're English speaking, there's clearly a cost arbitrage of 30 to 40 percent. Um, that's what groups are reporting to us when they compare London with Dublin. That gap clearly narrows when they're comparing Dublin with other EU jurisdictions, but their financial modeling is indicating that on an after-tax basis, Ireland is turning out to be the, the most attractive location. A lot of groups have also, I think, recognized some late in the day that you could fall into the trap of viewing Brexit as something to respond to narrowly in terms of setting up a new regulated entity within the EU and lose the opportunity posed by Brexit to look at the long-term configuration and footprint of your business in EMEA over the long term and therefore consider maybe both an operational benefit to the response to Brexit but also a strategic one around positioning for the future cultural fit, what would be the most innovative location to be in in the long term, which location could give us an uplift in relation to R&D or technology or the skills and quality of people. So when people broaden out their jurisdictional analysis and broaden out the matrix to look at those other factors, not just regulatory factors, Ireland turns out to score quite highly. And in terms of, say, some of those, say, high-profile maybe losses that, from an Irish perspective. Do you think we have anything to learn from those or could we be doing things better? Well, I think what, A, we shouldn't overreact um, to those in inverted commas losses. We don't view them as losses. We view them as companies taking decisions for the best interest of their firm based upon all the data and the, and the analysis to hand at a certain point in time. Decisions taken by companies are very company and context dependent. So there's a recognition in my organization that we won't win every investment. Ireland will not turn out to be the perfect solution for every group. And you have to respect groups' decisions in that regard. Also, some of the groups that have elected to move the EU-facing piece of their business or the regulated entity post-Brexit to another jurisdiction have considerable business in Ireland anyway. So it's, it's not as if they're abandoning this jurisdiction. Sure. For a variety of reasons, they've decided that this jurisdiction best meets their needs, and we respect that. Yeah. And Garvin, you, you, we spoke over lunch, and you, you, you had a similar sort of perspective about the companies taking it, the strategic opportunity to take a long-term approach. Yeah. Um, you, and, and you had this sort of, your view was that maybe uh, when people start to see the longer-term picture that maybe 
Yeah, I, I think, again, when we were going through <clears throat> the evaluation process around jurisdictions, um, and again, uh, legal in general have you know, not insubstantial funds um, uh, based here, um, it, it was very much a case of taking a look around the strategic certainty that what you were entering into. Um, so I think without meaning to kind of um, make uh, Kieran and his team embarrassed, I, I think the, the IDA did a fantastic job in terms of influencing uh, our teams that came visiting the centre. It was a very, very comprehensive presentation around the various juris or locations in Ireland that one might actually establish, be it Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Galway, um, uh, Kilkenny, etc., etc. <clears throat> but also the whole um, uh, analysis of the skill sets available, the infrastructure available, the professional services available, the, um, the clarity of, of the regulatory environment that is here, the legislation, the common law legislation, and the benefits that that actually presents to a lot of insurance providers. Um, and you know, if, they were if they were contrasting locations, they said what was good about Ireland, which again, I think some people find maybe a little bit frustrating as well, is that there's absolute clarity around what is expected in Ireland. It is written down. In many other competing jurisdictions, it's not written down, so it's based upon an understanding. And I think it was quite interesting what Jerry Cross said um, earlier today around the, the uh, principles that were going to be established around oversight of authorizations and... Um, and ongoing supervision across jurisdictions, um, that that means that actually what Ireland has written down you know, puts us in a, in a much better place to actually prove that we are consistent with the principles. Uh, and also it may well be a case of, well, somebody's written, gone to the trouble of writing them down, why don't you all adopt those principles or maybe even clearer written down uh, rules? So, uh, as I say, maybe some see that as being a disadvantage, but certainly from our perspective, we would see that as being a very clear advantage to what Ireland was, was offering uh, LNG. And, uh, Helena, we, again, we spoke a little lunch, but maybe sticking in the, in the same theme of uh, taking a longer term approach. Um, I know many people so far, I suppose, have been reacting to um, Brexit as a great disruption to business. Um, but it's, it's a lot more than that in the sense that it is the new and changing face of Europe. And you had an interesting perspective of not getting too caught up in addressing the immediate disruption of Brexit, but, but looking beyond. Yeah, I think we need to look beyond the um, individual cases, the wins, the losses, the because we're going to have a very strong pipeline as well. And I think that's something that Garvin is uh, uh, backing up in terms of the work that the IGA and, and also uh, the Department of Finance has been doing, certainly in, in terms of um, some of the clients that we have had looking at Ireland. But there's more going on, and Brexit is not just about, you know, the three priority issues right now. Brexit, there's a, a full-blown regulatory change almost or supervisory convergence that we're now talking about in relation to Brexit because Brexit is giving the opportunity to the EU 27 to actually redesign the framework to prevent the supervisory fragmentation and the supervisory gaps that we're actually currently talking about. I mean, I think if I did a straw poll of this audience and, and asked you how many of you here actually had a little bit about AIG going to, uh, to Luxembourg, I think we'd all probably put our hands up. But I mean, we need to get a perspective on, on what's going on and in terms of the, new, the numbers that are moving as well. In some cases, and this is back to uh, the point that Jerry Cross was making from uh, the central bank this morning, at the European level, we have the European, supervisory, uh, the European supervisory agencies, be it AOPA for the insurance, be it ESMA for the securities, the investment side, and ABA for the banks. They are all looking at this individually, but also as a collective. And without doubt, we're going to be looking at firmer rules, if not regulations, in terms of A, the structure of those three entities, in that th those three entities could merge, they will be getting uh, a broader mandate, more teeth 
to their to their to, the, to what they do in terms of um, supervising and making sure that the rules are in, uh, implemented. I think what Minister Murphy has done has actually allowed us to bring that conversation up and bring it up to a level of where we have the chair of the single supervisory mechanism, Danielle Newey. We were just mentioning this before Kieran came in, um, talking about, you know. <coughs> Although we have a single rule book in banking and everyone thinks that's great, there are 19 versions of that single rule book. So we're now going to have to have some harmonization of, or at least some clarification in the national discretions that some member states are using in order to get a competitive advantage. There, there is a perception, if not we don't have proof, but a perception that supervisory practices are being used as a competition tool. Part of that, even under the what we consider the rule book for banking, where this isn't supposed to happen, it does because there's flexibility built into the likes of the Capital Requirements Directive, which are allowing member states to look for something that fits with their economic uh, models and also their attractiveness, because Brexit is facilitating that. So my broader point is that let's not lose sight of the fact, certainly from an, uh, an industry perspective, whether you're on the fund side, insurance side, banking, it doesn't matter. There is a redesigning right now of the supervisory framework, and that's going to have an impact on us. We're all talking about the banking union, and, and we know how that has changed, how, how the, the, the whole banking of, of of Europe, be it small banks to SIFI banks, um, we are heading in a, a similar direction when it comes to uh, the European supervisory agencies uh, in respect to securities and also uh, insurance. Okay, a lot of financial services there, Ron. <laughs> the, um, the, but, it, but it does raise sort of an interesting question on a number of fronts. I mean, obviously, um, I suppose the big question is how do we, as one of 27, ensure that Ireland's interests are dealt with at the European level. Uh, getting on beyond that, how are the interests of the financial services industry and more specifically the insurance industry in Ireland, how are, how are their priorities going to be dealt with in the context of these Brexit negotiations, especially, I suppose, since we've lost, de facto, or as a, as a, we're losing our big brother, who historically would have helped us in all these, these things. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it is true to say that I mean, Brexit is obviously unprecedented in terms of its challenges facing the state economically, socially, um, and politically. Uh, and, and certainly, um, we as a government identified even before the referendum in terms of our contingency planning the real effects that Brexit would have on Ireland. And we were very early in, in defining what our headline goals would be in terms of the negotiations, the minimisation of the impact on our trade and economy. Uh, maintaining the gains, uh, protecting the gains and, uh, of, the, of the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement, including a, avoiding a hard border, maintaining the common travel area, and probably most importantly, keeping Ireland at the heart of a strong European Union. Um, and that goes to the debate around the future of Europe, which some of these issues around financial services and the future of financial services will be part of uh, going forward as an EU 20, 27. Uh, so that, I mean, we were very early on able to, to define those priorities. Uh, and then to go out and basically sell our story to our EU partners. And since November, there's been over 400 engagements with EU partners at official and political level, led by the Taoiseach, by the Minister for Foreign Affairs, by the Minister for European Affairs, where we've got a really good hearing about our particular priorities or particular issues. And we do have very unique issues compared to a lot of other member states, uh, but also not unique in terms of trade and economy, but certainly the disproportional impact of Brexit on our trade and economy compared to other member states is huge. Um, and there's a real recognition of that now at the European Union level, which have been reflected in the guidelines and in the directives just adopted, ad adopted this week. So I think we're in a good place in terms of our headline priorities going into the negotiations. But now we think we have to get into, it, into the next phase, and certainly at our government level, we're pivoting more now towards looking at the uh, economic impacts of Brexit, the sectoral impacts of Brexit, including on financial services, uh, and picking up on a lot of the messaging and, and good information that we're getting from stakeholders, including from the financial services sector, to bring that into a government strategy of how we mitigate the risks of Brexit for different sectors, um, both in terms of, of uh, domestic measures, but also in terms of how that will fit into the negotiations in Brussels once we get into the future relationship issues which will hope, hopefully hope, uh, start quite soon uh, once we've dealt with some of the priority issues in the, in the coming weeks, in the coming months. Um, but then I think beyond that, 
and certainly the 400 engagements you've had with EU partners since last November is not just an, uh, an opportunity to talk about Brexit, uh, but also an opportunity to talk about our shared interests within the European Union uh, and to see which member states are like-minded. Because, yeah, absolutely, the UK leaving is going to have an impact on the dynamics within the European Union. And yes, we were uh, closely aligned with the UK on many issues, not all issues. I think that should be clear that we do have alliances with other member states and a lot of other issues. Um, but it will be a loss. Uh, and now we need to work on building alliances that we have within the European Union to make sure our interests in the areas like financial services are also reflected. And there is many states, member states within the European Union that do share our views in relation to financial services. So it's, it's a question of building on those alliances now. And, and Ron, one of the, uh, I suppose, the, the big issues for the financial service industry, generally, not just the insurance industry, is um, negotiating a transitional arrangement. Um, and um, when you look at some of the commentary, I think it was Sir Ivan Phillips said the, the negotiations would be gory and twisted. And um, uh, certainly uh, Jonathan Hill wasn't too optimistic about uh, the prospects of the negotiations even getting much beyond the starting point. Um, what's your sense of, of, I mean, when you look at, say, for example, the EU and their insistence on a very phased approach, meanwhile the UK are saying we want to do, negotiate trade up front, how do we get to the point where we have a discussion that lasts long enough to negotiate an agreement, but more especially, I suppose, a transitional arrangement. Um, do you have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, I've been mean, talking first of all about maybe about the first, the, the phased approach, and this has been set out in the guidelines by the European Council and the directives adopted this week. Uh, I think, from the European Union's point of view, a phased approach is very important in that we have to do it in the framework of Article 50 of the treaties. So there is a legal framework which we have to follow, and that talks about withdrawal, uh, and, and therefore we need to agree the conditions for that withdrawal. Um, and certainly the European Union see the priorities within that withdrawal being the issue of citizens' rights. And I think certainly from a political point of view, people want politicians and the European Union and the UK want to put people first. So there's a lot of uncertainty among, among EU citizens in the UK, UK citizens in the European Union and their families and they want certainty. So I think it is right that those issues are looked at quite early on in, the, in negotiations. Then there's issues about the, the UK's uh, uh, financial liabilities um, and certainly that is going to be a very difficult and thorny issue uh, and you can see it already from the commentary that's around that issue, particularly in the UK. Um, and certainly from Ireland's point of view, and this has now been brought forward in the, in the directives, we're looking at basically look at the principle of the UK accepting that there is liabilities, which they have accepted as a, as a withdrawing member state, there is liabilities. They've made certain commitments during their membership, particularly in the, in, under the last um, uh, budget of the EU um, and the multi-annual financial framework. Uh, and they need to be honoured. Uh, and what we're looking for them to do is to engage on the principle and then look at the methodology. And that figure, the figure, the bill, will not be calculated anytime soon, it'll be calculated on the day they leave. So the talk of figures is very unhelpful and certainly I think that's not good for a constructive negotiation. And then we've managed to get our issues top of the agenda as well in, in phase one, um, to issues around the border uh, and looking at those, at those issues early on in the negotiations. So that's kind of phase one and I think that's an important in terms of the legal framework we're working within, but also important uh, for keeping, maintaining the unity of the 27 as well, that we look at those very important issues for the European Union. But the European Council has also decided that what we're looking for on those issues is sufficient progress. Now, they haven't defined what sufficient progress is, and it will be for the European Council and the Head of State and Government to decide, to decide what sufficient progress is. So that's a political judgment, uh, and certainly a lot of member states want to get onto the future relationship issues as quickly as possible and into phase two. And in phase two, which we hope will happen maybe by the end of the year, maybe even the autumn, depending on how the initial negotiations go, um, We'll be looking in parallel at the detailed negotiations on the withdrawal agreement and then also looking at scoping out the future framework. Um, and then within that, we're also going to look at transition, or transition arrangements. And certainly Ireland has been very, um, uh, very uh, adamant that we need a transition arrangement. And I think even if you look at it from a legal point of view, it's inevitable that we have to have to a transition arrangement. Because if it, the future relationship agreement, even if it is agreed within two years, which is unlikely, you'll have up to a period of ratification, and in that period you need a certain level of certainty and continuity. Um, and certainly we've been arguing, and this has been agreed now at the 11 member states uh, and the EU, is that we need a transition arrangement for that level of certainty and continuity for businesses as well as citizens. Um, so I'll be optimistic about a transition arrangement. And I don't uh, put you on the, the spot, I don't, I don't put you on the spot but 
What sort of a transitional arrangement or period do you think? Well, I mean, it's difficult to speculate in terms of because the negotiations haven't started yet, yeah. uh, and um, I think. Uh, but I think everyone has accepted, and even and the UK has accepted, they, they might define it differently. They call it an implementation period. Um, but it is, a, it is a transitional arrangement. I mean, in the best case scenario, a transitional arrangement would be the continuation of the application of the key by the UK for a period of time until we get to a future relationship and situation. The, and the European Court of Justice? Well, that means that in that period of time, as it says in the guidelines, if that was the case, then the obligations that goes with that would have to continue to apply to the UK. So that means the four freedoms, the freedom of movement of people, uh, the jurisdiction of the ECJ paying into the EU budget. So they're all difficult issues and that's something that the UK will have to consider when they come to the negotiation uh, uh, table. Um, but uh, certainly it's very hard to speculate in terms of how long it will take to negotiate a future relationship agreement uh, and when that will be in place. But the objective is, is to have a bridge between the withdrawal agreement and the future relationship agreement. Um, and looking at it from a very political point of view, you could think that you're looking at maybe a two or three year period, but at this stage it's very early to be definitive on that. Okay. But they, they think that they're definite about it, that it should be time bound, because I think it's in everyone's interest that we don't have an open-ended traditional period. There's a level of certainty for businesses and citizens and well, member states. I, I was hoping you were going to say seven to ten, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, maybe we might just take some questions. Um, Kieran, a lot of these questions look like they're going to be directed at you, so uh, I'll, I'll maybe put the first one up. Um, it said, good comments on Brexit, but are IDA and the Central Bank of Ireland doing real research in companies seeking approval rather than responding to applications filed so they can engage more appropriately at an early stage of engagement? And the short answer is yes. So, I mean, our approach to Brexit, so we would have had it on our risk register in the lead up to the decision last June. So we were already having early stage discussions with clients to assess their likely response. Once the UK, the outcome of the UK vote was known, we immediately undertook a sensitivity analysis of our portfolio, all of it. It's important to remember that Brexit impacts all of the clients here, not just financial services, to identify the clients most impacted by Brexit. And then we immediately began a dialogue with them, both locally in Ireland, where they had a presence, and at corporate. Um, and clearly presented why Ireland was an obvious solution to some of the challenges that they were, they were facing now as a consequence of the decision. So I would describe us as more proactive than reactive, so mindful of the complexities that the groups have been facing since June in terms of fashioning a response. We've been at the centre of some of those discussions and we've been a partner in their due diligence for quite some time. Yeah. And I, can, I, can, I mean, I can vouch for that myself, I've seen that myself. But. And, and just, to, just to, to validate that, that, again, our experience has been very much a proactive, a proactive um, engagement with the IDA and equally, I think that, that the whole coordination between the IDA and government has been uh, noteworthy. So having an international financial services minister really does make a considerable difference um, to uh, the offering that's being made to to the marketplace. Um, just, just on that, that point, uh, Garvin, because I mean, obviously in your former life as an advisor as well, I mean, given your position as that former advisor and also now obviously a senior position in LNG, what, what do you see as being, um, we've heard from Kieran obviously, what, what do you see as, as Ireland's real offering over and above its competitors at this point in time? Well, its real offering is, as I, say, as I said earlier, it, it is that certainty about what you're getting. Um, and I think that's very important. I do think at times we, we, we beat ourselves up unnecessarily. We, we seem to indulge in public self-flagellation uh, to a significant extent, which a lot of countries actually avoid doing. So as a result, we, we almost feed the, 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 the negativities that, that Ireland actually may well have, but negativities that are shared across multiple jurisdictions in the EU, EU and you know, primarily our competitors as well. Um, so uh, if we step back and take a look at ourselves in terms of what, our, what our, um, our, our significant offerings are that are attractive, I think, I think all, all the points made by Kieran are absolutely valid. Um, uh, connectivity, I mean Ireland now has incredible co connectivity. I mean given that I am a, a, a weekly commuter between Dublin and London, I've got 53 flights per day to, to choose from, um, and 
you know, aside from, I think you were saying, Hong Kong to Taipei is the only other um, uh, channel in the world that has that, that type of connectivity. So for, for organizations that, that do have a presence in the UK, um, should people decide to relocate to Ireland or should they ch choose to do a, a five-day week in Ireland and, and, and remain with their uh, roots based in the UK, that is something that you know, is achievable subject to the free movement of, of people type of legislation. Um, in terms of other, other unique um, uh, offerings is, again, some of our legislation is considerably better developed than other jurisdictions which um, facilitates particular con types of constructs. There are other areas where, again, Ireland needs to be able to probably develop um, incremental, uh, I I incremental uh, legislation, but it is stuff around the edges as opposed to core central planks. Um, I think also at times, we, again, looking at it from being a previous advisor, uh, frequently, we looked across jealously at maybe the way Luxembourg organised its offering by having a one-stop shop in terms of having regulator, legislator, um, uh, IDA equivalent advisors all in, a, in, in more or less a single building. Um, we have, we, I mean, again, as evidenced by the IDAs engaged with ourselves, we do that, but we don't necessarily present it that way. We probably are shy, a little bit shy, around um, projecting that particular offering. So if there was a bit of advice, um, we, we, we should kind of get, a, get out from underneath the, 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 the leaf and, and be a bit, a bit more brazen about saying that we are very connected between um, industry promoter, uh, regulator, government, and uh, professional advisors. Maybe, Helena, wearing your Brussels hat, I mean, what's your assessment of how well Ireland has been performing and maybe not just Ireland, but other jurisdictions as well. But if you're standing back and you're looking at the overall performance, how would you assess it? Um, well, it's a competitive landscape. It's not a level one. And because of that, it's, there's pockets of, of that uh, playing pitch, as I say, that's harder maybe to win business um, than heretofore. Um, but we had three clients um, who l were looking at uh, Ireland, certainly our, Dublin was in the shortlist. One has gone to Brussels, one's in the Netherlands, trading platform Netherlands, um, and the other's making a decision. So, you know, again, it comes back to, I guess, what Brexit is highlighting is that there is a need for that convergence in respect to supervision. Um, you know, uh, Minister Murphy um, certainly has you know, from our dealings with him again, it's been very positive in selling the story for Ireland. But I do take up the point that, that Gavin is, is Garvin's making because, you know, it's about communicating out, you know, the, the, the integration that Ireland has and the strength of it because it's what somebody might be buying into now in terms of a member state that they're moving to might look very different under a new, as I said, the supervisory framework is going to be re redesigned, might look very different in two years' time, three years' time. We need, again, none of these companies are moving because they've suddenly realized that, oh, Ireland's a great place to go to, or even the Netherlands is a great place. They're moving because they're seeking certainty. And their investor base is asking them, what's your plan? And if that wasn't pushing them in enough, we have the Bank of England PRA as, as has already been said, setting a deadline for the 14th of July, saying, what's your plan? Um, so therefore, again, Ireland has a strength in that, in actually articulating the fact, going, you know what, we are very robust. We do want certain standards. We've put a flag down on that. We might lose business as a result of it, but the long-term projection, and I think, you know, uh, Kieran, to maybe reference something that you're saying in terms of, you know, looking at the long-term uh, prospect here in terms of an operational strategic perspective. That's not just a, a company line, that's a country line as well. And I think it's right for the central bank maybe to be stepping back and saying, we've put the flag down for a reason. How they communicate that is a different thing. Very good. 
Uh, Kieran, a lot of the questions here I shared with you afterwards are really for you, and some of them are actually quite specific questions that maybe rather than open them up to the, to the floor, um, sure. I'll let you maybe invite people to approach maybe Kieran directly afterwards, you're around for a while. Sure. But one of the questions just here was, um, is IDA also, and maybe at the end of this as well, Kieran, maybe ask because we're coming close to the end of our time, uh, at the end of the, answering this question, if you maybe, um, if you did reduce it to one, one point, what your, what your key message would be uh, for the conference here today, and I'd ask each of you maybe just to say if there's one parting message that you had for the, uh, for the conference. But for the question to begin with is, is IDA also targeting captives and smaller companies that on their own may not be huge employers, but together are an important industry? Yes, because we have a strategy for the development of the sector across all of the business lines, if you will, not just insurance. So banking, asset management, insurance, reinsurance, financial technology, payments, etc. So our approach to the development of the industry is to view it as an ecosystem comprising different sectors, subsectors, activities, and firms of all size, scale, and scope. So we want to enrich that ecosystem. So we're equally interested in attracting in small firms, which we have. In, especially in the payments and financial technology area. But then equally, we're talking to some of the largest broker-dealers in, in the world. We, we need and want both. So you want to build an ecosystem? Yes. yes. Very good. Uh, Ronan, you've got 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Uh, um, I suppose the key message, I think, from, our, from the point of view of the government is that everyone, I think, needs to approach these negotiations in a, in a very strategic, constructive, clear-eyed way. Let's, let's be sensible, let's be pragmatic. Uh, let's try and take as much of the politics out of it as possible uh, and do what's in the interest of everyone, the EU, the UK, and our citizens and businesses most of all. And certainly in government, we want to hear from everyone. And we see this very much as a, as a national issue. Uh, and therefore, we want to hear from all stakeholders, from business, uh, across government, across the agencies, to make sure that we're uh, getting all the views and problems in so that we can present those to our partners in the EU and in the negotiation process. Uh, and certainly up to now, I think we've been very well prepared and will continue to be very well prepared and intensify that, that level of work um, and certainly go forward into Brussels uh, positively in terms of uh, promoting Ireland's interest in these negotiations. So I think just the main message is, is let's, let's sort of uh, keep calm and, uh, and negotiate. I think that's very basically. Good. Garvin? Uh, I suppose, again, probably less self-flagellation, um, more around, yes, there have we are, been... We are, we are Irish, Garvin. I, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, we, we obviously have had some high-publicised, let's say, misses, but there are lots of positives, I think, um, uh, which haven't necessarily be, been announced. Um, I do think that, again, from a, from a government infrastructure perspective, say, between... IDA government and um, uh, regulator, you know, being more you know, open about communicating how that has successfully worked together and, and less, less shy about that. And you know, I do believe that you know, some of these more, more high publicized, um, uh, as I say, misses will be well and truly counterbalanced by a lot of you know, very strong positives. Helena, can I maybe jump in and maybe make a stab at your, our joint message, maybe? Okay, go which ahead. Is, I knew you'd have a soapbox. So <laughs> I can find it just to 15 seconds, which is, I mean, I think the, the point you made earlier in terms of, I mean, what we have here is more than just a huge disruption. We have a, a, a changing face uh, within Europe. And what we're looking at, uh, you've got to p put it in perspective that the UK is the largest recipient of FDI in the whole of the EU. And that's where the opportunity is, that's where the runway we're looking at is. It's not just looking at how do we facilitate uh, people coming in or uh, uh, fixing their businesses or dealing with Brexit, but it's how do we uh, win as much of that new business that would have otherwise gone to uh, the UK. With that, I'll thank my panel. Uh, six seconds over, so we better get off the stage. Uh, Ronan, Kieran, Garvin. Alina, thank you very much. Thank you.